Hi everyone, I'm Kieran. Hi, I'm Paul. And welcome to Cave Escape, episode three. And this week we'll be discussing a couple of articles once again. And in the future, hopefully, Paul and I will manage to get an interview with someone a bit more interesting than, than ourselves. Uh, but for now, we're, we're talking current affairs and we're talking politics. And um, Paul and I decided that because last week uh, we discussed Paul's article first, this week we're going to dis- discuss mine. Now, the article I'd like to discuss, it was actually, it was, it was published, uh, I believe it's published on the CNN first, but I read a, a blog called Zero Hedge. So if any Zero Hedge fans out there, probably going woohoo um which is they focus they tend to focus on uh, american and world um sort of economic issues but they also also discuss politics and history and i, I guess it's sort of a an alternative financial slash current affairs blog which has become more and more mainstream since the since the economic crisis uh, in 2000 and 2008 when when it started and anyway this was uh, this was the uh, the article which discussed u.s foreign policy change and one of their actions which occurred last week in which the united states decided to paradrop 50 tons of ammo uh, in pallets onto the most dangerous place in the face of planet earth as described by zero hedge which is syria so they cancelled their equip and train program or train and equip program rather and they've just decided to equip now and this is be- they had 500 million dollars uh, earmarked from congress i believe the, the the state department and the u.s military to train some syrian friendly so-called moderate syrian rebels and equip them with the weapons they need to help fight isis was the was the main reason and of course the secondary reason um, which is, I think, non-controversial, would be to fight Assad's forces. But the, the main reason they claimed was to help fight ISIS on the ground, to try and get this natural uh, body of, of Syrian individuals and train them up with US special forces, give them some weapons and go, there you go, go and fight ISIS, because uh, we're not sending in any troops after what happened in uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, or what's still occurring in Afghanistan, actually. We, we can get into that a little bit. Um, and I thought this is a really interesting article for a number of reasons. I guess the main the main reason I was really interested in it was to just be able to talk about what's happening in Syria and what's happened in Syria over not just the last few years, but over the decades and even getting into some of the deeper history over the, over the century uh, about what's happened to the Middle East and the West's role in what's happened to the Middle East, which is rather extraordinary, I think, anyone who studies history specifically um contemporary history with regards to the middle east will know just how horrendous and destructive some of the policies especially by western governments have been there so i just wanted to talk about a little bit of background to the current and ongoing civil war in syria and any of you who who follow uh, current affairs would have known about this because it's been going on and intensifying uh, over the last few years so it essentially started in early 2011, the spring of 2011, with protests, and this was uh, this was within the context of the the Arab Spring protests, which and revolutions, which took place, which beginning with Tunisia in 2010, and it spread to Egypt and obviously to Libya, and there are protests in almost every Middle Eastern country, actually, um, and even wider parts of Africa. Some of which led to regime change, and um, Every country had its own sort of social and cultural context, and obviously the protests were more successful in some than others. And in Syria, after some nationwide protests against President Bashir al-Assad and his government, who was the, the essentially the dictator of uh, of Syria, um, he he responded with pretty much violent crackdowns. Is the best way to to describe it, and the conflict sort of gradually morphed. Um, and turned into an armed rebellion because, well, violence beget violence and um, people started fighting back against the government's violence and um, it just spiralled out of control and got worse and worse until I think by to, by early 2012 it was quite evident that um, a, a civil war or some sort of civil conflict was occurring uh, and it's so far it's taken the lives of... Uh, over a quarter million people and it's displaced uh, almost half the country internally and it's caused millions to flee to other other countries and um, almost all the infrastructure in the country has been destroyed 
uh, and I think many parts of the the country are pretty much unlivable right now. Uh, so it's really tra- it's quite a tragic story. I mean, not not quite. It is an extraordinary tragic story. And I just wanted to go into some of the, uh, the the deeper history of the U.S. and and West's involvement. And the the first thing I actually did want to talk about is going all the way back to to World War One. And I know we're talking about the U- the U.S. para dropping in these fifty tons of ammo, but considering all the players and allies in the region, I think we have to go back to the the agreement that was signed in. 1916, which pretty much divided the Ottoman Empire up between the uh, main imperial powers uh, of victors, so-called victors in World War One, France and Britain. Um, this is a, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which was signed by the British and French diplomat uh, in secret. It was actually leaked by the uh, by the Russian government, uh, who were party to it before the revolution, and uh, uh, Lenin, I think. Um, leaked this in 1917, which really obviously angered a lot of the Arab states who were promised independence, and it essentially divided the region up into spheres of influence or zones of control. So Iraq and Syria in particular, and Jordan and and many other countries around the Middle East, they were drawn on a map by uh, overtly colonial powers and divided up into what they decided should be their 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 areas of influence, which is usually a pseudonym for economic and political exploitation. Um, and Syria was um, essentially mandated to France and Iraq to Britain and Jordan, I think, to Britain and Palestine became sort of a mandate area under the League of Nations. And all of the Ottoman Empire was just divvied up between these imperial powers. And so we have to say at the start, I mean, that these nation states of, Sy- of uh, Syria being one of them these are artificially created, if you can have a naturally created uh, a, a, a state. That's another debate to get into. But what I mean by that is these were just wholly drawn up by imperial powers. The same way much of Africa and uh, a lot of the issues, uh, some have argued, historians and political scientists have argued, is because colonial powers came in and they divided tribes and they didn't, a lot of times, didn't even uh, take geography into account and they just divided the lands up, lands up based on on uh, their own power, on their own material interests, and this has caused huge issues ever since. Uh, so I just want to get that out there, uh, uh, to, to talking about some of the some of the history of, of Syria, and, and and fast forwarding now to the U.S.'s foreign policy, which has um, been uh, extraordinary in a few ways. One of which, because I guess they've decided they've sort of jumped from being directly to indirectly Im- involved. Um, but I just want to talk about the U- some of US foreign policy towards Syria uh, during the Cold War. And what's a little known fact, which hasn't been mentioned much by, by some of the, the mainstream media, and I think it has direct relevance to our understanding of Western foreign policy in the region now, is that the US planned in late 1948 and went ahead with, in 1949, uh, the covert undermining and overthrowing of the democratically elected government in Syria, uh, which is really quite interesting. For most of you who study uh, US uh, in- intervention and the history of US imperialism, uh, sometimes there's a tendency to think about uh, Iran in, in 53 and Guatemala in 1954, about these clandestine activities of of the CIA going in and supporting and, and helping to overthrow democrat- democratically elected regimes uh, uh, and to achieve US economic and political interests in the in the area. But but actually in 1949, the US helped helped overthrow. Um, and why did they do that? Well, the, the, the declassified files and all the information uh, about at the time is because they wanted to build an oil pipeline. This is the um, an oil pipeline through through Syria, the Trans Arabian Pipeline, and all the other countries in the region had agreed to it, apart from Syria, uh, and they had agreed to it in 1947. And the pipeline was was stretching across the Middle East, and they wanted to go up through Syria, I think, uh, into into Turkey and into the Mediterranean. And at the time, uh, the proposed project was one of the largest and most sophisticated uh, oil pipelines in the world. Um, it's called the, the the Tapline project, and uh, as soon as 
as soon as there was a coup d'etat, the military coup d'etat supported by the CIA, so the military officers overthrew the dem democratically elected government, um, what do you know, the, uh, the project was immediately ratified in the <laughs> by the government and allowed to go ahead. And uh, this was a very significant pipeline, which lasted, I think, in one form or another, all the way up until 2002. So, uh, and it, at the time, it was the when it was constructed, it was the world's largest oil pipeline, and it was transporting at its peak uh, half a million barrels of oil per day um, to the to the other countries in uh, in the region and into the Mediterranean, I believe. So, I just wanted to talk about uh, this sort of covert influence and the foreign policy of, of, of Western powers and what some of their interests may be there. Because a lot of people have talked about that uh, neoconservative arm ideologues in the US have since 1991 have been talking about overthrowing what they'd call client states of the Soviet Union, such as Syria. And this came up again in, in 2000 and, uh, 2001 and 2002, where General Wesley Clark... Um, who, whom I believe had just retired from the government or, was, or wasn't working as a general anymore. He went to the Defence Department and uh, spoke to some of the people who used to work for him, some lower-ranking officers and generals, and they, they directly told him that plans are being drawn up for the toppling and the regime change of, of, of seven governments in the Middle East. And the list was Iraq, Syria, Libya, Lebanon, Sudan, Somalia and Iran. And thankfully, not all of those uh, um, governments have been toppled and not all of those regimes were changed and war wasn't waged overtly or covertly, I don't think, on all of those states. But obviously, uh, since 2003, Iraq and Libya in 2011 and now Syria, um, all, all of which seem to be facing regime changes. And the US's role in this is, is quite difficult to pin down purely because so much information is classified um, and uh, in the dark and that, that in itself generates lots of problems and lots of sort of conspiracy theories so we, we don't exactly know the whole role that the US has been playing but getting back to to my article so 50 tons of ammo was dropped to friend so-called friendly rebel groups um, which the US and their allies have been supporting in the region to fight ISIS and uh, and to fight Assad and I guess the the main one of the main things I <clears throat> I took away from this article just before I, I, I shut up and let, let talk Paul uh, was that I think the US more and more is, is quite actively desperate and more and more you can see it's it's a, a superpower which is in decline and or, or maybe even it's a great power now. Is it, is it so super and that their foreign policy in the region uh, has been confused and it's been they have have been unable to manage their, their their allies in the region as well as they maybe uh, once could and that seems to be actively in competition with with countries which you think would be direct allies such as Turkey and Saudi Arabia and they also seem to be struggling to challenge new rising powers or newly arisen powers such as Russia such as uh, Iran and also indirectly China as well who's been quite silent um, with regards to uh, w what's happening in Syria, but they've also been willing in the UN to veto any overt military action in Syria. So it's quite obvious that they're at least indirectly supporting the Assad regime. And I, I think for me, this idea that the US, that they've realised they can't go in there and train people on the ground and that all the people they did train were quickly, they were either killed or they fled to the other groups who they didn't want them fleeing to, who were more overt sort of um, Islamicist groups with radical ideas. Uh, and uh, many of the weapons that they gave over the last couple of years in this training program, they found their they found their way into the hands of ISIS, the very enemy or the Islamic State, the very group that they're meant to be fighting um, for various reasons. Uh, and this is, and I think the war. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about, the war seems to have quite clearly, with Russia getting now, again, overtly involved, uh, it's quite clearly turned into a proxy war between um, Russia and Iran, obviously Assad in Syria, and uh, Iraq on one side, with China indirectly supporting all of these, and the US, uh, its Western allies, and some Gulf allies on the other. And uh, geopolitics and power is definitely a significant role and maybe we could have been tricked into believing that democracy and and uh, freedom and liberty and uh, justice 
was <laughs> was at one time during this conflict something uh, something of a significant factor which we need to take into account um, it, it seems to really have devolved into just m multiple factions multiple groups just vying for control and power and at the expense of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of civilians, mainly obviously Syrian civilians. And it's obviously attracted thousands and thousands of fighters, mainly um, Muslim individuals who feel they, they're going to go and defend fellow Muslims, I believe, uh, against Assad and other regimes vying for control in the region. So uh, it's, it's a really, really quite extraordinary um, conflict that's occurring there. Uh, and anyway, I'm, go I'm going to stop talking now, and I'm going to let I'm going to let Paul talk. So I realise I've been yapping on now for, for quite a while. So that's my my two cents on the uh, on the on the article. Anyway, <laughs> that's brilliant. I, I want to bring it back to that that image of Lenin as some kind of whistleblower. <laughs> right, right. Just kind of in a, in a parking lot somewhere, acting like deep throat, leaking documents. I never like, <laughs> I never I consider that that guy capable of those those actions. We that, that's a great great story i really enjoyed it the, 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 you're right there's so many different areas in this story different topics in a story to cover it's very very interesting uh, i specifically looked at one case that i was reminded of uh, through syria that i think is very relevant but it has similar questions coming out, coming from it but also as it's historical uh, i think that we can uh, great understand the long-term implications of what's happening now and also understand why what's happening now is happening um, but on the other hand you, you, I think you explained it quite well uh, what, what I want to talk about was the Kamonk the Laotians or La Laotians I'm not sure the, the people from Laos right, right. They were hill, I think they were hill tribe in Laos which the American CIA the only CIA trained during the 1970s to fight off Vietnamese communist, communist forces uh, at the time, the communist forces from Vietnam were building the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which is a smuggling trail, and it was going through Laos. Uh, America did not like this. They trained the La these Hmong people to fight back, along with fighting their own government, the Laotian government, which was communist. Mm. Uh, as a consequence, there were about 60,000 soldiers trained and 100,000 Hmong lost. It's quite, it's quite similar. It was quite a kind of covert operation. It's actually quite, it's quite well known now. There's quite a lot of you know, articles about this. There's articles in the NY Times, the Diplomat, the Time magazine. It's very, very interesting. It is very, very parallel to what's happening in Syria. Uh, as at the same time, it was the Soviet Union versus the West concentrated within Southeast Asia and this kind of geopolitics emerging as a consequence with the U.S. doing a lot of very, you know, uh, on, how can I say this, um, dodgy things. Uh, you know, it, it, they're very, they're very uh, controversial by nature. They, they were car carpet bombing surrounding countries to Vietnam who are neutral. Laos wasn't neutral in the war until America involved itself. Uh, you know, Cambodia and, and Laos also suffered from Agent Orange, which America used to bomb Vietnam. Either way, what happened was that this was all kind of central area between two big powers, the Soviet Union and America, and consequently America started to use people in ways they saw fit. It was quite a, it's quite a large effect from this. The Hmong are still running away from the Laos government in Laos right now. Uh, this is, you know, 40 years later. They're still hiding in the jungle wow. with the Laotian government trying to hunt them down. Their old general, Vang Pao, offered to come back. He's in America, obviously. He was, he was a refugee, I, I assume. And he's in America now, and he offered to come back to Laos to help negotiate peace times between the Hmong people and the Laotian government. But they refused because they said if he was to return, they would execute him. So there's a lot of bad blood. But but, but what's interesting is is that they, they, they conducted this war in complete secret. It wasn't, you know, at a time of mass media, television was revolution at a time in the way it covered news. The Americans didn't manage to uncover this event until much later. And it was it's just quite a distressing distressing action to hear about how they how they utilize people for their own their own needs and, and it kind of it's parallel to Syria because they're not they're not caring about the locals or the effect it has and the divisions it makes they're just caring about actually sometimes quite minor things you know vietnam building a, a supply trail through laos isn't isn't necessarily the, the, the kind of worst atrocity in the world to stop they're literally just trying to win a war and spreading the war to other other countries so as we're telling in syria now it could be an extension of other local conflicts in the area so was this Laos conflict, which had extended from Vietnam. Uh, it's quite sad. But uh, the, the research behind it was fascinating. Um, 
you know, uh, there's a great document I think we'll put put in the YouTube link and in the blog post, uh, actually from the CIA, CIA.gov, uh, in which they describe what was happening in Laos at the time. There's a lot of kind of, uh, I'm not sure how much you know about Kieran, there's a lot of accusations of drug smuggling f- actually from Laos, heroin in general, mm. uh, specifically from one plane the CIA used, an American Airlines plane, to send supplies and so on. Uh, and it's great talking about to read from the CIA.gov because I've never seen a, a big kind of authoritative, secretive governing agency actually publicly kind of try to correct its, its relations image with the public. So, you know, they're talking here about the, the film where where this accusation came from. Uh, I, don't know, I haven't got the name of the film here. There's a film that came out in, I think, the 90s that kind of disc- that was trying to accuse the government of selling drugs from Laos. And the CIA.gov documents talking about how it's not very not very legitimate source and how they, you know, that they actually it was a really good operation, which the, the director of Central Intelligence claimed was uh, very dangerous and difficult, but a major operation and successful, a superb job. Uh, and it's just it's just a really kind of human view of the CIA, um, almost scared of this kind of what they think is a smear tactic from the film, accusing them of selling drugs. But anyway, it, um, I, I don't know how you feel about Kieran. I, I feel that it, what we're seeing now is a repetition of not just the Hmong, the Hmong people in Vietnam. There's a, actually a very minor episode in a, a lot of general episodes where the Americans have done this. We've also got Afghanistan, and again, the consequence of training. You know, Al Qaeda to fight the Soviets. We now see in Afghanistan still affected by the wars. I, I would say. And last year, the, the civilian casualties in Afghanistan hit an all-time high. Uh, so you know, th- these things were happening out in Syria. It's not necessarily going to end um, as soon as Assad tumbles. These things continue. These kind of conflict continue for decades. As the Hmong have, they're still fighting with the local government because America supported them. Uh, not because it spoiled them, because but there's still there's definitely still a dislike because of the events that happened, which America did not stop; they just aided. Uh, so I, I find it, I find it, I find a kind of a continual chain of 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 ill events that that kind of fit a grander tapestry of not just American foreign policy, to be fair, but also general foreign policy by most big powers. It's just that America happens to be the one that I find most distasteful and most most powerful. Um, but you're right, it's interesting to see that China, for instance, is not involved. I didn't think of that. Yeah, no, that, that was great, Paul. I didn't know uh, a lot of that history. It's really interesting, and the parallels are, are uncanny. I mean, as you, as you mentioned, uh, and it, it, it's something that they repeatedly do, and by they, I guess I'm talking about the CIA, the State Department, those policy wonks that, some, that think this up and, and recommend it to some of those in the in a circle of the National Security Council, you know, others might say it's it's the deep state, especially when you're talking about drug smuggling and using those funds uh, uh, probably to, to buy weapons to fund other anti-communist groups and what have you, right? And, and probably skim a few uh, thousand off the top for yourself, uh, which tends to be the case. Uh, and I, I just wanted to say it's really interesting that the CIA responded directly on their website with like a public public relations Piece. It's, it's, it's so pathetic. Yeah, do you know what it reminds me of? It, the State Department and um, they did a, a, an almost exactly the same thing when Dan, uh, Daniel Ganza's book came out uh, in 2005, which is his NATO's secret armies uh, terrorism and terrorism in Western Europe, and that was basically uh, uh, it was a history of, of the false flag attacks. Uh, carrying out during the Cold War uh, under the guise of sort of NATO stay-behind operations, these parallel military units which are meant to stay behind if the Soviet Union ever invaded these countries in Western Europe and sort of cause chaos and act almost like the French resistance did against the Nazis, right? And how some of these units actually got involved, because they're very right-wing and anti-communist, they actually got involved in attacking civilians and and false flag activities where they would um, kill members of the state and, and... blame it on on communist uh, blame it on communist and anarchist parties and left wing parties to try and discredit them and the CIA came out and or the state department actually you know wrote on on, on their on their website and they're saying well this research is uh, you know the book the book's not really well researched it was it was it was published by an academic press uh, um, Rutledge or however you pronounce that Rutledge press um and uh, but they basically came out and said it's not well researched. It, it's there's there's no real evidence linking the CIA uh, or the U.S. government to these activities. Blah blah blah. Uh, and and it was 
and they basically said one of the documents he used to try and show um, US complicity was clearly a Soviet f- forgery. Now, admittedly, there are some questions. Historians still debate that, but it was it was just quite interesting. It's very interesting when they come out and actively try and attack or discredit and do such a really quite a poor job <laughs> doing it. And yeah. it always makes me laugh because I think if anyone goes to read that, it, it's such an average job they've done. They're going to go and read the book and find it's like it's actually you're shooting yourselves in the foot releasing a statement like that. Well, yeah, I would. Don't, thought... don't go and read this book. It's not very good. Oh shit! The yeah. CIA said it's crap. Let's go read it. It must be. <laughs> it must be legit. They're really stupid, aren't they? I just. <laughs> You would really think the public relations side would be much stronger. I guess they never really had to do that. They've been so secretive in their operations. They don't have mm. to interact with the public that much. They haven't got a YouTube channel, I'm sure, for instance. Mm. It would be great. I'd love to see a podcast or like a kind of a video, info video from, from a CAA top, top info, you know, informant or something. But it, it, I guess you know, when you read this, it does, it does make me skeptical of, 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 of their intentions. You know, it, A book like we, the book you just quoted, I haven't read it, but I'm sure... It's con- you know it sounds slightly controversial. It, it sounds well researched, academic, but it mm. sounds like the CIA could quite easily twist that or yeah. just ignore it and let people attack it for them. So for them to come out and and, and criticize it um, quite brazenly, it makes me think that perhaps there's, there's something else going on there. But you know, definitely with this, there's, there's a lot of accusations in Vietnam of, of the opium that came out of there, uh, just like in Afghanistan right now. A lot of people accuse Afghanistan as being not accused, but they observe that Afghanistan has increased the amount of, I think, heroin. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, heroin production in the world, and most heroin, heroin is, comes from Afghanistan now. Um, and it's just interesting to see that these kind of drug, uh, drug dealing accusations pop up in these CIA strongholds. But yeah, I, 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 I read this document; it's very interesting, and they kind of they, it's really kind of a, a twist on what happened. But there's no way you can really twist what happened with the Hmong. These people. They might have been fighting with their local government, but the CIA really just trained them for their own purpose to fight off communism. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm studying refugee studies right now, and this is how I came across this this problem, this this event. And there, there's a there's a, a massive flight of refugees from Laos as a consequence. Hundreds of thousands went off to Thailand, hundreds, you know, over land, risking their lives to escape the local government because these conflicts ex- exacerbated. At the same time, during this, the Vietnam War. Uh, oh, sorry. After the Vietnam War, America was you know, working with Thailand to bomb Vietnam from Thailand, and they were supplying, they were training Thai mercenaries to fight the Thai, the Vietnamese. Uh, as a consequence, they kind of supported Thailand, and the refugees came in because at the same time, Cambodia was having problems with Pol, Pol Pot, who America were supporting through China and Thailand, and Pol Pot was committing mass genocide. So they were supporting militias in all, all over the place in Vietnam. So actually, I, you know, I'm wondering nowadays whether that's you're talking about now being a kind of uh, decline of America perhaps Vietnam was Vietnam was one of the first big losses they had abroad during I think during the time of Nixon who's obviously one of the first presidents they realized was corrupt such a pivotal moment uh, and I'm wondering whether that might be the slow decline of America there and, and not now maybe I, I don't know what you yeah. think no, I was you know I was about to ask you the, the same question actually I mean people have talked about the decline of America I think since the, directly since at least the 19... 19- 80s there's a famous mainstream scholar paul kennedy who wrote a book and it was the rise and fall of great powers and it was a very from an international relations perspective you would call it a realist book but it technically it was it, it was you know um, just a history book of, of great powers and how they rise and fall and his focus was on material and economic interests and basically if you have a sound strong economy you can afford the best military and the most advanced technology to support that military and thus you can conquer and dominate other states and he was linking the um, the economic sides of states directly to their to their their military and, and talking about how the US because it's can, you know now now struggling against at the time I think it was Japan and uh, a renewed Western Europe and basically that the US will be um, failing to other powers. I mean, people have talked about this since then. I mean, I'm not sure the debate rages on in the academic literature. There's the declinists on, and there's the, the, well, not revivalists, but there's those who say the America isn't in decline, right? And it's really difficult to, to look at one point in history. Uh, I mean, from a just an, an economic perspective, I think in terms of percentage of GDP, the US has definitely declined. I mean, what they account for, I think... It, Post World War Two, it was like half the world's economic output 
yeah, it's from America, yeah, which is yeah. which is crazy. That's the most disparity there's ever been between one state and the rest of the yeah. world, basically. Uh, and I f- and it's slowly but steadily been in decline, especially with the rise of China more than anyone else since since the end of the Cold War. And I think I think the latest statistics show that it only accounts for like nineteen percent now, which is still really? the biggest. But obviously, China's. I mean, just if we're looking at that one variable, but it's, it's not just about economics, of course. I don't think that's, that's fair to say. I mean, the world system as we know it, which was established in uh, 1944, 1945, this post-World War II, built primarily by America and um, with, this, with some advice by Britain and accommodating, obviously, Russian power as well. Uh, the, 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 we live in in a world in which a lot of the structures and systems, you know, the, especially at an international level, the UN, the IMF, the World Bank, these are all US created, made, thought up institutions where they they had a lot of influence and sway uh, within and still do in, internally. So the way the world trades and operates uh, um, on that level, at least, is still very much a very US uh, uh, skewed way. Uh, I mean. It's really difficult. The, the two things which show to me that I think the US is really just, just, just struggling to, to manage other powers such as Russia and even Iran. I mean, first in 2013, remember there was this chemical weapons uproar and their own their own public, right, or world opinion. People, there was the, the chemical weapons attack. They said uh, Assad can't use chemical weapons on his own people. It's a war crime, so we have to go in and stop him, right? And then there was some controversy and some people said, well, we're not entirely sure it's Assad. The rebels, especially um, Al-Qaeda affiliated al-Nusra, they've been using chemical weapons just as much. Um, and we don't know who this, who carried out the attack. And maybe there's some sort of false flag going on. That wasn't discussed directly, I don't think. But there was some confusion. And uh, the US said, well, we're going to try and go in. We're bringing in, a, you know, there's going to be a coalition. And the French said yes. And the British said, we're going to go in. But then Parliament had a vote on it. And for the first time in, in, in almost historically, yeah. historically, one of the first times ever, yes. the Parliament said, no, we're not helping. And then America thought, oh, crap, the, uh, one of our uh, closest um, allies or, or, or puppets uh, has said no. And... Um, <laughs> And everyone started basically thinking, I, I mean, I, I must admit, I can't remember the granular details of what happened then, but, but basically the overt uh, military intervention was, was just completely derailed, wasn't it? And everyone around the world and public opinion polls all showed that in the West that no, I don't want to send troops in. We shouldn't go over there. Look what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is a nightmare. We, you know, we can't do this again. This is crazy. And uh, it happened in America and it happened in Britain. And it, it's amazing that they couldn't rally their own supporters around, I mean, what some have argued was another lie or exaggeration or, or, or um, around sort of this, this idea of, the well, there's chemical weapons being used, so we've got to go in there and save the civilians, right? This, this rhetoric, which was, it was clearly seen through by the people, by the public. They said, no, yeah. this, is, this is rubbish. Uh, this is nonsense. And, uh, and then the second thing is, well, they'd obviously been using covert means um, to try and support the opposition to Assad, but they ramped it up, I think, since since that point and directly tried to have their own groups on the ground. Um, but it's been a complete failure and they have this weird um, two-level uh, 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 foreign policy going on where they want to counter ISIS because ISIS is anti-American, it's destabilising the region. And at the same time, they want to stop Assad. But Assad's biggest opponent is ISIS. And the allies in the region, such as Turkey, have turned a blind eye, if not elements within the Turkish state, have actively helped uh, ISIS because ISIS are fighting the Kurds. Turkey uh, has a huge Kurdish minority in the country, especially in the um, uh, east of the country. And the Kurds have obviously want their own nation state and, and pretty much always, always have. Or at least since... will do, actually, eventually. Well, yeah. you know... Ha- yeah, you, you would hope they'd get uh, some yeah. recognition, right? right. And but, but every country in the region doesn't want them to. Yeah. Because yeah. they take parts of their own territory the away. Right. So, yeah. yeah, so Turkey's turned a blind eye and actually actively helped on some occasions. Uh, I think there's there's enough circumstantial and anecdotal evidence to say that. Actively helped uh, ISIS in many ways. And then you've got um, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, who, again, if they're not directly helping ISIS, they're actively helping other Islamists who have a very similar ideology. Uh, many of which, say, yeah. 
Al Nusra, yeah, many of the, which are affiliated with with groups such as Al Qaeda, and these are the so-called allies uh, uh, of the West at the moment. And that's their one policy, right? And the other policy is well, the, well, they're trying to get rid of Assad at the same time. But they, so it just seems to be a complete and utter shambles. And and then Russia's had to come in here and 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 now overtly supporting. Uh, sad something america thought they would never do like they don't have the technical logistics their military is not good enough they're too scared culturally of of u.s you know uh military dominance but they've just gone in and done it and there's nothing the u.s can do and it just looks like more and more on a, on a military basis not even just an economic one now they don't they it, it's like the emperor has no clothes as they say that that famous anecdote you know everyone's looking at the u.s but really they're they're very much a naked empire they're not that the strength we think they have isn't really there anymore. But to draw a bit to my parallel with Vietnam, because mm. I think this is, you, you know, you're absolutely right. It, it, they look so lost. Uh, and especially, I can talk more about Britain in terms, of, in terms of Saudi Arabia. You saw that interview with Jon Snow and David Cameron, where he was kind of... He oh, was, yeah. yeah, it was brilliant. <laughs> Jon Snow destroyed him, i, yeah. I got to say, to be very, very colloquial. He really put him down, criticised him about Britain supporting... Uh, Saudi Arabia, their yeah. allies, business-wise, and so on, supporting them and their human rights record, and I think the UN. Yeah, yeah. But but then on the other hand, David Cameron's attacking extremism uh, and spreading this idea of hate uh, through his Islam. Islam, uh, even though he's supporting his allies with people who support Wahhabism, I think it's called. Yeah. Which is the most extreme, one of the most extreme forms of Islam, one of the most hateful, and is one of the most influential in terms of making terrorist groups, if you want to call them that, like ISIS and like or ISIL or like Al-Qaeda. It's a very influential ideology. It's very, very strict and oppressive. So he's really kind of stepping on his own feet. I mean, a parallel I want to make, actually, which I just thought of now, to be honest, is that actually you need that kind of common em- enemy. And right now, Islamism and ext- you know, extremismism is that enemy. The-, the parallel with Vietnam at the time was that it was communism. So at the time, commun- communism was a kind of unifying thing to hate. You had the McCarthyites who were Persian communists from America, which is absolutely unbelievable to think about now. They are literally driving Americans out from being communists. Uh, almost akin to the Indonesian genocides in, I think, the 1960s, but without the violence. Uh, so it, it, there was that common enemy they made there, and now Islamism is, uh, is Islamists are, are, are that common enemy again, and they're trying to form image around that. But it's just too complicated, I think, to make that image. It's not as unifying. You know, when it was communism, you had you know, Russia was a big grand enemy. It was very, very perceptive that Russia was communist, and it was very perceptive that they had a Soviet Union. And now the Islamists are kind of, they're not actually that combined by Islam. They're actually, it sounds like they're quite different. You know more than I do, Kieran, on this. But they sound like they're quite, they're not, they're not as commonly held together, united. Just like Al-Qaeda, I think, were, were, were not necessarily one group. Again, Kieran, you know more. But, but it's, it, I think, I think that's one struggle. But again, it's, the parallels are again clear, you know, with, they supported China in, in the Vietnam, in the Vietnam region during the, after the Vietnam War in the late 1970s and, and, and before in the early 1970s, which Britain were part of, by the way. They tried to sell Harrier jets to them in the 1970s. And, and China were clearly communist. They were clearly communist. It's just that they had a quarrel with the Soviets. So, so because, Soviets were deemed the bigger enemy. They wanted to support China against the Soviets. And then they supported people like Pol Pot, who was just a brutal, despot, despotic dictator. He was an awful guy. Uh, he committed mass genocides of Cambodians. And then did that just to destabilize the region further. So it's just a kind of the classic story of picking picking the enemy that suits your needs or picking the, picking the people who suit your needs. And it goes, I can tell you, Kieran, it goes back to the Athenian times when the, the Athenian Empire was around, and I've discussed this before with one of our friends, Ed Callow, um, I think, are you friends with him, Kieran? I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I know Ed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a nice guy. And I'm discussing, because we did classical studies as our first degree, undergraduate degree. And, you know, the Athenian Empire, they used to kind of, they were, they were <laughs> funny enough, the, the actual democratic, more democratic than we are now, true direct democracy. They were like the symbol of that, the crea- creators of that. And yet when they made their empire, they didn't, they didn't kind of, they said that they they promote democracy and so on, but actually they, they promoted whatever suited them. So they could take over some countries or islands, sorry, countries, uh, policies they're called, little regions essentially nowadays, and 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 put in place whoever they wanted that would suit their needs. So they could put in place an oligarchy or put in place a tyrant. Sometimes they put democracy. Sometimes they invade democ- democratic countries. It depended on what made them more powerful. And it's the same now with America. The, 
choosing who to support in the Middle East is so difficult because it's not a common ideology like they'd like it to be. It's not simply sold back here. People are smarter now. They understand after, I think, after Iraq and Afghanistan, which were absurdly chased, the, the reasons given for invading Iraq and Afghanistan were, were given as, as the same package, but they're completely different. Uh, you know, Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with Al-Qaeda, that's clear, and no WMDs. So people get closer to, closer to the truth now. So things are getting in doubt. America are really struggling to, to, to rebrand themselves almost, to find a new way to to sell the same lie. And and I think that's a big problem. I think that's where they're failing. And they're still selecting the same people who help them. But upon that, that's evolved as well. People, you know, the Islamists aren't as clearly unified or even disciplined or anything as as america like to think they're not it's not like it, it was in the 70s of the communists uh, you know southeast asia was fairly unified in comparison i think i, I don't know what you think kieran no i mean i, I would agree with, with pretty much everything you said no and, and definitely there's 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 thousands of of islamist groups all around the world with with varying ideologies and varying interpretations of the text i mean this is one of the debates i had last week with with my students in my class we were talking about what causes non-state terrorist actors um, to to um, or non-state actors to commit acts of, of terrorism and is religion does religion play a role and the counter argument to religion was actually well when we talk about religion it's a body of text right there's usually at least one doctrine and there's thousands of interpretations and many of them have completely peaceful and pacifist sometimes interpretations and others have completely violent and and hateful filled interpretations so how can you blame the religion itself when uh, there's a there's a clear subjectivity there based on a on each group and even, even arguably even each person who who will re- who will read that text some of which you know they'll read it in a very um, fundamentalist and literalist way and others who'll think well this is all anecdotal and this means this and what he was trying to portray was actually this and they'll look at it in the, the social and historical context and they'll interpret it in a very peaceful way so I think you know I mean bringing religion in is always problematic and there's almost always actually and behind that is always almost always political goals I mean even with people like Osama bin Laden and al-qaeda i mean what were the grievances well if you look at al-qaeda's early early propaganda the 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 main hatred was the fact that the u.s had troops in saudi arabia since the first gulf war when uh, saudi arabia invited the u.s and britain to and helped paid for the war against uh saddam hussein in kuwait when he invaded kuwait and they hated the fact that there were u.s western troops stationed on the holy land in saudi arabia and he hated the fact that we supported Israel and their occupation of uh, Palestine and Palestinian territories and expansion into that. They were the two main political grievances, uh, both of which were, from many Muslims' perspectives and many people's perspectives around the world, they weren't completely unjustified and unreasonable. They weren't completely radical and outrageous, right? Uh, It was, why are you supporting Israel when Israel's clearly systematically impoverishing and disempowering and... uh, 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 arguably slowly but steadily colonizing parts of Palestine, right? And the UN, this isn't just mere rhetoric, by the way. I mean, the UN has there's, has dozens, I believe, of resolutions uh, against Israel saying that basically you can't be on the you can't be on Palestinian territory and you can't expand onto it, which you've continually been allowing many of the uh, more extreme religious elements in Israel to do, right? Uh, uh, and this is going to cause huge tensions, and I think it causes huge tensions for anyone. Uh, and and um, the political grievances in many of these is, I mean, even something with ISIS and the, the Islamic State, right? Um, uh, clearly, a branch of you know, they clearly emerged out of a branch of of uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq, which was fighting U.S. and British forces who had invaded and occupied a foreign land, right? Um, it, it's important to to remember that, and uh, yeah, the other thing I just I just want to say. I mean, I, I would agree with you. It's a sad state of affairs that so many of these um, these foreign policy issues pa- parallel with they go all the way back to the city states in in Greece and and uh, of the Athenian Empire, and many realist scholars of the in international relations theory, they would they would cite. They would cite that, and the the famous historic historian who who's the famous ancient Greek historian. I've got not not uh, not Herodotus. Uh, this uh, uh, what's his name? 
the Citytus as the worst name that will come up in my mind. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, anyway, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, anyway, sorry. Yeah, so there, there, there was a famous historian who wrote <laughs> about it, didn't he? About the wars, about the the Peloponnesian Wars. Was it, um, oh. was it Peloponnesian Wars? Um, yeah, it was. That, and um, a lot of IR scholars from the realist field, they will quote that as the first sort of realist interpretation of international relations based on that, based Thucydides, on that history. What's his name? Sorry. Pardon? Thucydides? That's Thucydides, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, oh, God, I've um, read this whole book. Anyway, sorry. That's <laughs> okay. It's many book. years ago now, Paul. <laughs> yeah. Thucydides. And uh, it, it's a sad state of affairs. And, you know, I mean, I have to say that's at least partially true that that very little has changed in those sort of power dynamics and and unfortunately a more radical interpretation for me personally comes of that and i just think well if it's part of the system and the structures and the institutions that we've built or allowed to be built around us as humans we've got to change them they've got to change that they're not good enough if it leads to this horrible war and the supporting of dictators and suppression and, and war crimes and gen i mean all sorts of, of madness i mean and the, the one thing that does give me hope in this, this internet age of information is that the alliance with countries such as uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, Saudi Arabia in particular, the alliance that the West has uh, clearly undermines any moral ideas of moral superiority or any ideas of ethics built into our foreign policy and the fact that because we have a form of liberal representative democracy that our foreign policy must is based on some form of human rights is clearly uh, undermined i mean saudi arabia a country who uh, beheads beheaded more people than isis this year i believe you oh, know really? well, oh it's saying crazy the hundreds yeah. of people been beheaded threats of people being crucified and, 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 and whip, yeah just for drinking alcohol half the population the women have no rights essentially uh, yeah. i mean it's it's madness it's really it, and it's obvious it's for their all to see and David Cameron says laughably that oh the alliance do you want to know the real reason it's for, <laughs> it's for security they give they the worst, provide us intelligence right what from know, themselves I mean <laughs> the worst part of that was you could tell he just he was stuck in a rut he didn't know yeah. what to say so he, he essentially just had to think of a, something something on yeah. the spot he's yeah. not I, I'm not sure he's that good at it he doesn't do very no. many tough interviews and so no. he just uses classic rhetoric right. security yeah. which is and, a, which is you know always liberty impeach you know always used to yeah. kind of impede liberties or excuse any kind of immoral act. Sorry, yeah. Kieran. Yeah, I was going to say he would have been more honest if he said, "Oh, it's because uh, they're the oil interests and the fact that they have put so much money into our economy, whether it's the elites buying up property and and or whether it's buying them buying bonds, you know, government bonds and uh, the the trade that goes on with the weapons manufacturing, the fact that Britain sells you know advanced yeah. weaponry to these countries. It's you know." It, it, he would have been more honest if he said something like that, and I would have, I would have almost congratulated him for undermining his own rhetoric. But uh, <laughs> he but, doesn't he doesn't look like that. Um, no. Yeah. Anyway, so, I think we've we've talked about my article for uh, a good good portion of time. Should we should we move on to to your one, Paul? Sure. I'm not sure how much time I personally have. To be honest, uh, we'll be able to do it next week. Yeah, what, that's fine. That's time? up to you. I mean, yeah, we've been talking a while, so we can save that for next week. There, yeah, that, sure, because I'm sure we can talk about that that for a while. Do you want to tell people what it is, or do you want to leave leave them guessing for next week? <laughs> no, sure, absolutely. It's just the the recent. It's not a phenomenon. It's it's a, the TTIP deal that's coming through. It's, it's it's under a lot of debates, under a lot of secrecy right now. Um, there's transparency issues. It's a very interesting uh, deal that's that's currently being negotiated between the EU and uh, I think Northern America. So it, it's more about that and the effect it has. And again, parallels in the past. It's not the first of its kind. There was a NAFTA deal. Uh, and I just think it's a very interesting topic to get into. Unfortunately, it won't happen today, but it's it's something that's going to have a big impact on all of us, to be honest. I, I, actually, almost more obviously so than the actual actions in Syria, sadly enough. But yes, that, that that's that's the topic for, I think, a fortnight's time. Right, Kieran? Yeah, no, definitely. Great stuff. We can discuss that then, and um, I'll... Uh, I'll try and get an article in as well if we, we have time. I think when there's when there's key issues such as or, or complicated historical issues, um, I'm happy to uh, to talk about just one of our pieces because we have to get into some depth. Otherwise, we're not you know we're doing Absolutely. the same as some of the media and some of the politicians. We have to talk about some of the deeper uh, you know um, events and 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 some of the some more deeper historical analysis 
Um, and it all goes back to the Ottoman Empire. Clearly. Well, exactly. A lot of it. Well, you know, this is the thing. It does. That's what really I started does. with. You know, it's yeah. scary. It's scary that an agreement between France and Britain in the middle of World War One, uh, a secret agreement, that's helped shape some of the dy- dynamics in the Middle East to this day, and some Let's of the see. inequalities. You know, it's, it's extraordinary. So it shows you how important some of these uh, events are. The last hundreds of years, it's the same Vietnam. It's divided between North and South, just like North and South Korea uh, after World War Two. And that even affected the kind of the refugee trails and so on, and helped helped even more divide the people. It's it's it, you're absolutely right. Africa, another great example of a completely divided continent artificially and not reflecting the actual tribes and people. Exactly. But I, I, I got a feeling we could go into this for another hour or so. I'm sure we could, but yeah, we'll yeah. we'll have to end it there. Yeah. Um, okay. So goodbye, everyone. Thank you for listening, and uh, see you in a couple of weeks. <laughs>